Good morning. It's my great, great pleasure to present uh, Dr. David Schuster, my friend and colleague, uh, as the Grand Round speaker this morning. Um, uh, David uh, is an associate professor of radiology and imaging sciences in the Department of uh, Radiology and Imaging Sciences. He's the director of nuclear medicine and molecular imaging. Uh, David uh, got his MD degree from Al Albany Medical College, and then he did residency at Tufts, and uh, uh, after that, um, he did fellowship at Emory. And um, uh, he has uh, been uh, involved in many national and international uh, committees and uh, done a lot of research in, in imaging, uh, particularly uh, uh, his uh, area of uh, interest is molecular imaging with uh, amino acid uh, analogs and uh, uh, recently one of the uh, agents uh, developed here was approved by the FDA, the Oxymen scan, PET scan. Uh, David uh, is on the editorial board of uh, nuclear medicine journals and uh, he's uh, had many uh, grants uh, out. Uh, uh, outside grants, uh, especially NIH grants as a PI and co-PI. Uh, uh, he has uh, many uh, grants that funded his research. Um, he's very active uh, uh, nationally and internationally uh, uh, at uh, organizations, uh, clinical research, and published uh, numerous papers and is a reviewer of uh, uh, many, for many journals. So, without taking too much uh, from his time, uh, David. Thank you very much. So, today I'll be talking about um, new molecular imaging and therapy that uh, we're going to have at Emory. These are my disclosures. So, we're going to start with uh, two very different patients. The first patient um, has a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. And he was uh, imaged with conventional uh, SPECT, or single photon somatostatin receptor imaging. Uh, this is Indium 111 Octrea scan, which we have available at this institution. This is the same patient imaged with a PET version of the somatostatin receptor analog called gallium 68 dotatate. And we could see not only is one of the uh, tumors uh, seen to better advantage, but there are many, many more foci. And in a small study at Stanford, management was changed in about 75% of patients. This is a different patient. This patient has a PSA rise from a nadir, uh, PSA to three, milligram, three uh, nanograms per ml post-brachytherapy, radiotherapy, and androgen deprivation therapy in the past. Bone scan and CT were negative. With flucyclovine PET, which is a different type of radio tracer, which I'll be talking about, we have uh, positive activity in the prostate and also positive left common iliac node. And this was histologically positive and obviously influences the approach to the patient. These are the topics I'm going to be discussing. First, we're going to talk about gallium-68 dotatate and the plan for clinical availability at Emory. So currently, there are many molecular imaging techniques for imaging neuroendocrine tumors, but they're very much in the past. The first is indium 11 Octrea scan and also I-123 MIBG. These um, examine uh, different aspects of uh, the um, neuroendocrine uh, metabolome, you could say. Um, and these are spec tracers with suboptimal diagnostic performance. The sensitivity in the literature is about 50 to 70 percent, but in practice, the sensitivity is actually lower. Now, there are newer PET agents available, and these include, you may have heard, gallium-68 dotatate, dotatoc, dotanoc. They're basically all the same uh, variations on a theme. And with PET imaging, we have improved resolution and sensitivity and improved accuracy over anatomic imaging and the single photon tracers. Another advantage is that you can image uh, the patient. After injecting them, you wait about an hour, so maybe the whole process takes two hours. 
versus typically two days for Octrea scan as well as MIBG. And the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society recommends DOTAPET imaging for evaluation of patients in the localization of the primary tumor. This was uh, from an NIH study where they evaluated uh, gallium-68 uh, dotatate PET, and they compared this to conventional imaging, including Octrea scan, CT, and MR. Uh, they studied 180 patients, 56 with follow-up scans, and 40 had surgery. And dotatate PET detected 95% of the lesions, while CT and MR detected about 45%, and Octrea scan even less. In this study, this was a larger study than the one at Stanford, 33% of patients had a change in management based on the Dotatate PET. So Dotatate uh, was approved uh, last year, and um, FDA approved, that is, and it's something called the NetSpot kit, and it's used with a gallium generator. This is actually a pretty expensive device that you have to replace, oh, every 10 months or so. And uh, you compound the kit and then release it for imaging. And the uh, FDA-approved indication is for localization of somatostatin receptor-positive tumors in adults and pediatric patients. And earlier this year, there was a pass-through code from Medicare, meaning um, the radio tracer itself gets reimbursed. Um, in a uh, recent review article, the recommended clinical scenarios included exclude more advanced disease prior to surgical intervention, identify the primary tumor in patients with known uh, metastatic neuroendocrine tumor, and that's been one of the uh, biggest advantages according to the people who are using it. Confirm the diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumor in patients with anatomic lesions that are suspicious for a neuroendocrine tumor, and identify patients who are likely to benefit from peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, which I'll be talking about as well. There's also one other indication, but it would be more off-label, according to the FDA, which is localized primary tumor in patients with biochemical or clinical suspicion of neuroendocrine tumor. In other words, you're not supposed to just use it if someone's chromogranin A is high or there's maybe uh, just some clinical suspicion. Uh, there really has to be some evidence that neuroendocrine um, uh, tumor is happening. So we have a state-licensed radio pharmacy at our CSI Wesley Wood Center, uh, just down the road where our cyclotron is. And um, there are advantages of producing this ourselves versus relying on, on a commercial unit dose. First and most importantly, it's not yet available commercially in Atlanta, though it probably will be by the end of the year. But by producing it ourselves, we have flexibility, we qualify for trials of next generation neuroendocrine tumor tracers and therapeutics. And actually, we've been approached in the past um, to uh, test some of these, but you really have to have a gallium generator. We could use the generator for other gallium radio tracers, such as PSMA and other novel peptides. And we are in a unique position to conduct research here, and this will help support our CSI infrastructure and expand research assets. And frankly, it's uh, uh, befitting a uh, comprehensive cancer center as we are now. So we're expecting the gallium generator to be delivered maybe this week. And we have the hope to have the first clinical doses maybe in June or July. It's going to take them, our radio pharmacy staff, a little while just to come up to speed and to make sure they're making it you know, according uh, to regulations. We plan to start two days a week at uh, Emory University Hospital and the first case in the morning. Because unlike FDG, where we have two hour half-life, so you have a little bit of room to play, here there's a one hour half-life. So you really don't want a lot of delays before you image the patient. So starting at a first case kind of uh, helps that along. Now our reference is 100 Octrea scans a year. So that's about what we do between here and Midtown. So we figure if we start off two a week and grow from there, that's a good place to start. Uh, will require support for imaging referrals, of course, and will need PIs and clinical leads to drive novel research. And on that point, um, Dr. Parent, uh, who is in my division, and uh, Dr. Avilan, who you all know, um, have secured pilot funds from Winship and uh, the uh, urology program, and thank you very much, and from our department as well, where we have a pilot program, for looking at prostate neuroendocrine tumor transdifferentiation. Um, with uh, gallium dotatate. So 
As far as cost, everyone kind of asks about cost. So a dose of Octrea scan costs us $3,500. That's what it costs us to buy from uh, the local uh, radio, commercial radio pharmacy. Plus, of course, is the two-day spec CT. And um, we're beyond what they call the three-year Medicare pass-through. So we can't charge Medicare patients for the radio tracer. It actually gets bundled in to the CPT code, which means that Emory takes a significant loss with each Medicare patient we do for Octrea scan. Now, some, we make up that in a little bit with the private payers, and we probably break even overall. In fact, some centers have stopped offering Octrea scan. Now, a commercial dose of NetSpot costs about $3,500 where it's available. The cost of the kit that they will sell to us is $2,900. It costs us about you know, $600 to pay radio pharmacy staff, et cetera, to compound it. So CSI will be selling the kit to Emory Healthcare for about the same price, plus there's the cost of the PET. And uh, the advantage here is that the radio tracer is paid by Medicare for the next three years at least. We're hoping to uh, change um, those policies nationally. And it's paid by many insurance carriers currently. So on a related topic, we're going to move on to therapeutics. So not only can you label dotatate with gallium-68, which is a PET radio tracer, to see where the tumors are, but you could also use that same dotatate to radio label with a beta emitter, such as lutetium-177, to perform therapy. Sort of the same idea as when we do the I-123 MIBG scan, and we see if there's uptake, and we know that we could treat a patient with I-131 MIBG. Sort of the same idea. It's a theranostics concept. So lutetium-177 is a beta emitter, and it's an advanced therapeutic. It's given in four cycles every eight weeks, and uh, it's given with amino acid infusion to protect the kidneys. Now, gallium dotatate is an ideal companion diagnostic, but actually, if you look at the um, um, brochure, it can also be used with Octrea scan, the investigator's brochure. This is the basic workflow uh, that a uh, patient gets antiemetics because the amino acid mixture that's currently available causes a lot of nausea. We're hoping to um, have an arginine lysine uh, mixture available by the end of the year, which um, causes much less nausea. And then the uh, lutithera, as it's called, which is the lutetium-177 dotatate, is infused by 30 minutes. Amino acids go in for another three hours, and then the patient is observed uh, for another three hours or so. Many of you uh, may have seen a New England Journal. Um, they uh, published the um, initial analysis of the phase three trial of the Netter um, uh, project or uh, Netter trial. They randomly assigned 229 patients who had well-differentiated metastatic mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor. And they had got either the lutetium dotatate every eight weeks plus best support, supportive care, octreotide 30 milligrams versus octreotide 60 milligrams every four weeks alone. And the primary endpoint was uh, progression-free survival, and they also looked at objective response rate, overall survival, side effects, et cetera. The progression-free survival on the pre-specified interim analysis at month 20 was 65% for the lutetium group versus 10% in the control group. That's a significant difference. The response rate was 18% in the lutetium group and 3% in the control group. There were four deaths in the um, lutetium group versus 26 in the control group. As far as toxicity, um, most of this is in terms of uh, lymphopenia. So about maybe 10% of patients um, can get a grade three or higher, um, uh, some type of uh, uh, blood uh, toxicity. There was no renal toxicity. The control group didn't have such toxicity, but there were a lot more deaths. But those toxicities are able to be managed um, by the uh, tools we have today. Looking at the Kaplan-Meier curves on progression-free survival and overall survival, we could see a significant difference with lutetium in the green and the control group in the black. As far as adverse events, actually, if you look at the total serious adverse events, they were about the same, but they were more related to treatment from the lutetium. So they concluded that there was markedly longer progression-free survival with lutetium, significantly higher response rate than high-dose octreotide. 
There was preliminary evidence of overall survival, um, which has to be borne out in the final analysis. And there was clinically significant myelosuppression in less than 10%. So um, the toxicity was uh, fairly well uh, uh, managed. So lutetium-177 dotatate is not yet FDA approved. They were hoping to have it FDA approved this year, but it is probably not going to be FDA approved until 2018. So we were um, approached um, by uh, the company, um, which is called AAA Advanced Accelerator Applications, uh, to have the expanded access program. And Basil and I kind of jumped on that opportunity. Um, it's already CTC and, uh, CTRC and IRB approved. That's the protocol. We'll dose the first patient maybe June tw uh, 23rd. And um, the therapeutic itself is free under compassionate use, uh, like, for example, some chemotherapy trials with EAP. And um, then uh, there is billing for the uh, remainder of the trial. We'll be doing the therapy in our HG unit, which is the lead-lined room we have um, in HG. Though lead shielding is actually not required um, because the um, radiation dosimetry is much less than, for example, when we give a patient 400 millicuries of I-131 MIBG. But a private bathroom is recommended, and HG is kind of the most convenient location. So it's an, done as an outpatient. They stay about seven to eight hours. So moving on, I'm going to be talking about a radio tracer that many of you know, but some of you uh, may not be as familiar with if you're new here, uh, which is fluciclovine or FACBC. So FACBC, otherwise known as fluciclovine or the trade name of Actumin, is a non-natural amino acid pet radio tracer. And unlike natural amino acids, fluciclovine is not metabolized, which is actually an advantage in imaging. This is a patient with a post-radical prostatectomy and lymphadenectomy, now rising PSA to 0.41. And with fluciclovine, we saw uptake in a sub-centimeter uh, right pelvic node, and this was biopsy proven to be prostate cancer. So there's a real scientific basis for amino acid pet imaging. Amino acids are in demand for both anabolism and catabolism, and they're important nutrients for tumor growth. They're involved in signaling via the mTOR pathway as well. Now, in many tumors, there's a metabolic shift in which glutamine is used as an alternative energy source to glucose. So remember glutamine in the next few slides. In fact, targeting the transport of glutamine inhibits prostate cancer growth in vitro and in PC3 xenografts. Amino acid transport is upregulated in many cancers, including prostate cancer. There are actually over 20 systems in general involved in amino acid transport in the body. These are the ones that are upregulated with prostate cancer. And ASCT2 and LAT1 are the two most important ones, and they're associated with more aggressive behavior, and they've been called the partners in crime because they often work in tandem. Now, naturally occurring amino acids uh, radio labeled with carbon-11, the short-lived carbon-11 with a 20-minute half-life, were studied in the past with some success in prostate cancer. But those weren't very uh, practical because of the short half-life. Now, most work with amino acid radio tracers has taken place in brain imaging, and uh, that is still the case probably worldwide. But we noticed when uh, Dr. Mark Goodman developed fluciclovine here, and it was being used for brain, that there was little urinary excretion. So we decided to investigate this in renal masses. And uh, this patient actually turned out to have, this is a coronal image. Uh, we see the right kidney, the left kidney with a mass. That actually turned out to be a benign rosé Dorfman. Um, and the patient had prostate cancer, but also these nodes uh, were enlarged and lighting up in the retroperitoneum. We thought that was going to be metastatic renal cancer because we didn't know that was Rosé Dorfman yet. Peter Nee went in, biopsied these. These were metastatic prostate cancer. So this led us to further evaluation because these were quite intense. We did a pilot study with some promising results, and this was uh, published in 2007. And while this was happening, some interesting work was uh, also occurring in Japan. Uh, because a Japanese company had licensed this radio tracer from Emory. They were looking at some of the basic science behind fluciclovine. First, they figured out that fluciclovine is transported most like glutamine. And we mentioned glutamine before as an important substrate for metabolism. And it's mostly transported by those two partners in crime. 
system ASCT2 with some contribution by LAT1. It's possible that that might flip as a uh, tumor gets castration uh, uh, resistant, uh, though more work has to be done with that, thus making fluciclovine applicable maybe in many stages of prostate cancer. There was greater uptake with fluciclovine, at least in these prostate cancer cell lines, than glutamine, methionine, choline, and acetate. Now, these systems mediate both influx and efflux. Uh, they're one-to-one -one exchangers, so an amino acid must uh, go out for one to come in, and vice versa. And that's the, probably the reason for the washout of fluciclovine in most lesions, and what we call an unkind, in imaging, downsloping time activity curve. So we have to image those patients in the first 20 to 30 minutes, within those first 20 to 30 minutes. And that early imaging is actually an advantage because unlike FDG, where the patient gets injected, put in a room for an hour, then it gets imaged, there's kind of logistic issues involved in that, you could just inject the patient on the table, wait five minutes, and image. Now, these images look different than what you're used to with FDG PET. The most intense physiologic uptake is in the liver and the pancreas. And unlike FDG, there's mild to no brain and bladder activity, though bladder does increase with time, and a minority of patients who are still trying to figure out why have some bladder activity. Nowhere near that of FDG, though. The dosimetry, the radiation dose, is actually similar to FDG PET. We completed a 115-patient clinical trial here at Emory um, funded by the NIH in recurrent prostate cancer. On a whole body basis, nearly 82% of studies were positive. Now, as is seen commonly with imaging of prostate cancer, as the PSA decreases here below one, the uh, positivity decreases as well. Though 39% with a PSA less than one is actually still pretty good. We uh, published a um, sub-study of the uh, patients who got both um, prostacent with Indian 111 cabramide pentadide and fluciclovine. Why prostacent? That's actually what the NIH was paying us to do. The strength of the study is that we powered it separately for the prostate bed and for extra prostatic questions, and we believe that's the most clinically applicable. Another strength of the study is that of all the patients we call true positive in the bed, 100% had histologic proof. And of all those patients that we call true positive for extra prostatic disease, that's on a whole patient basis, we can't possibly biopsy every lesion, 89% had biopsy proof. <clears throat> so first, unsurprisingly, fluciclovine uh, performed better than prostacin. And when we look in the prostate bed, the uh, sensitivity was significantly higher, though there was suboptimal specificity in the uh, bed itself uh, with a moderate positive predictive value. When we look at extraprostatic disease, fluciclovine correctly upstaged about 25% of patients and s detected significantly more instances of extraprostatic disease. So this is at all PSA levels. Sensitivity was significantly higher than prostacin, but with a high specificity and a high positive predictive value. From this trial, this is a patient with a PSA of 0.9 post-prostatectomy. We see it's positive at the anastomotic area in the bed. Um, it was biopsy positive. Patient underwent salvage radiotherapy and the PSA uh, nadir to less than uh, 0.05, thus also proving the true negativity of the remainder of the exam. Another patient with uh, conventional imaging, CT bone scan, prostacin were negative. Negative transrectal ultrasound and biopsy with a PSA 1.1 post-prostatectomy. The patient was scheduled for salvage radiotherapy of the prostate bed only per standard of care. With fluciclovine PET, we detected a five millimeter um, positive lymph node in the left obturator region, and this directed a biopsy, and this was recurrent prostate cancer also uh, changing the plan for the patient. We also compared fluciclovine to CT in another subset analysis recently published. And at every PSA level, fluciclovine is blue, red is CT. There was a higher positivity rate compared to CT. But absolute PSA is only part of the story. PSA kinetics are very important as well. So for example, when the doubling time is shorter, the positivity rate goes up. And also, when you have 
more aggressive original disease. So with the Gleason's uh, 4 plus 3 or greater, or the Gleason grade greater than 3, or greater than equal to 3, we have a higher positivity rate than um, when they were um, uh, less aggressive histologically originally. And that probably implies the recurrence is also more aggressive. Um, and this uh, was significantly better than CT again at all levels, of P at all levels in kinetics. At the University of Bologna, they completed an intrapatient comparison to C11 choline. Post-radical prostatectomy, both, uh, a patient got both studies within one week of each other. And that was also uh, recently published. Overall, they found a somewhat better diagnostic performance than choline, which is used throughout Europe and has been used for many, many years throughout Europe with thousands and thousands of patients imaged. Most of the advantage uh, was with uh, specificity and uh, interpretive ease. And uh, this was both on a patient and a region basis with fewer pitfalls. And production itself may also be an advantage. There's possibly some advantage at lower PSA and with smaller nodes, but that needs more study. And a fair question to ask is, would a higher choline dose, for example, like they use at Mayo Clinic, or the longer lift fluorocholine make a difference? And those studies uh, would have to be done as well. Here's a patient who had both uh, imaging. Uh, we see uh, the recurrence in the prostate bed with fluciclovine, but not with choline. Another patient who had a positive note on fluciclovine, surgically proven uh, to be uh, prostate cancer. Uh, this was negative on choline. And also, to be, to be fair, there were some instances of the other way around where choline visualized the uh, node uh, better than fluciclovine. Also recently published in Journal of Urology this year, uh, there was a 596 uh, patient multi-site uh, trial, which included our Emory data. The overall detection rate was nearly 68%. Metastasis outside the pelvis was detected in about a quarter of patients. And the PPB, the positive particular value for all sample lesions, was very high for extraprostatic disease and about 72% for prostate bed involvement. So our data was also validated at the other centers as well. Now, I think the greatest utility for now will be for recurrent prostate cancer. For identifying prostate cancer in the primary gland, well, not as much, but the work continues. So in our series that we published, we had a decent uh, sextant level sensitivity of 81%, but a suboptimal specificity. This is for primary prostate cancer. There was some correlation with Gleason score, but there was a SUV overlap. And we concluded that fluciclovine PET should not be used alone for radiation therapy planning, but may be used to guide biopsy to the most aggressive lesion. Barris Turkbay at the NCI did an exquisite study with multiparametric MR and step section histology and modeling, in which he showed that the multiparametric MR performed uh, better than fluciclovine. And while there was higher uptake in cancer versus normal prostate, with fluciclovine, the confounder here seems to be benign prostatic hypertrophy. Interestingly enough, MR in combination with PET had higher positive predictive value than either modality alone. And this has led us to some ongoing research using multiparametric MR and fluciclovine to help better direct the biopsy and stage the patient. Here we have a multiparametric MR showing the tumor and also lighting up with fluciclovine at both um, locations. We also are analyzing right now um, data off of our earlier P50 trial in which uh, we took 25 patients with recurrent prostate cancer or with biochemical failure at least. These were the non-prostatectomy patients. These are the ones that get most confounded by MR. And uh, we prospectively uh, performed fluciclovine PET, multiparametric MR with our standard sequences here on the patient. And the pertinent findings here, and uh, this is going to be presented at Society of Nuclear Medicine in a couple weeks, is number one, fluciclovine PET had higher sensitivity in the prostate bed, while multiparametric MR had higher specificity. But there was a higher equivocation rate with MR. So this occurred 
when we considered equivocals as negative for this analysis. If you considered the equivocals on MR as positive, actually they performed about the same with high sensitivity and low specificity with a moderate positive predictive value. In the extraprostatic region, fluciclovine performed better both in sensitivity and specificity at about 90% compared to MR at about 50 and 70%. Now we still believe that combining both techniques in some way may harness the superior quality of each and improve detection. We just kind of have to figure out what's the best way of combining them and not getting too confounded. This patient from the trial, a PSA 4.9, post-local therapies and uh, prior uh, ADT, had a negative multiparametric MR and CT for extraprostatic disease. In fact, they were noted to be unchanged from prior exams. With fluciclovine, we had uptake in a 7 by 3 millimeter aortic cable lymph node with a fatty hilum, that's the blow up, and this turned out to be malignant on laparoscopic biopsy. Thus, the patient had uh, systemic disease in the retroperitoneum. We also questioned, was our lower specificity in part due to sampling error in the prostate? Because our truth standard okay, was actually using blind biopsy. So um, this has launched a whole field of investigation at Emory, spearheaded by Bowie Fay, with PET-guided uh, transrectal ultrasound biopsy. We're also doing the same with MR. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, inclusion criteria of the R21. This is kind of just finishing up. We probably have three more patients, um, though I wrote fully accrued here. Preliminary results based on 27 patients is when we did non-targeted biopsy, they were positive in about 7% of instances. When we targeted it at our suspicion level four and five, the positivity rate went up to 36.5%. And if we used only our highest suspicion level, that went up to nearly 50%. So this tells me we probably need to play a little more with our interpretive criteria. This is a patient post-brachytherapy and rising PSA to 3.55, underwent fluciclovine PET in our trial in which the patient in the same sitting gets a standard template biopsy, and then the target is lit up, and that area is biopsied. And uh, we see uptake here on fluciclovine only in the left base with no extra prostatic uptake. The standard 12-core biopsy here was negative for malignancy with radiation changes. But the targeted core was a Gleason 4 plus 3. So we identified the recurrence. Note that two of the standard templates just missed the lesion. And this patient underwent salvage cryo, and the PSA was less than nadir. Another patient, PSA rise from nadir to 4.6. Uh, we had uptake in the central apex and the central uh, right mid gland. The standard truss biopsy was negative in all cores, and with our 3D targeted fusion biopsy, it was positive in both locations with Gleason 9 and Gleason 8, respectively. So with molecular guidance, we can direct the needle to the lesion with confidence and document location, determine if the lesion is outside of our normal local field, such as seminal vesicle, help completely stage the patient before considering salvage therapy, and this ultimately can be used with any radio tracer. So it's kind of agnostic for radio trace, so we'll be able to use this for others as well. Here's uh, Peter Nee and Viraj Master working the equipment. And I'll show you this little movie here. Hopefully it'll play. So they're honing in on the area which is lit up. You can see they have a guide to go in. Next steps include an academic industrial partnership. Bowie got another, an R01 um, for a translation of this. Um, the patients, now this is for patients on primary disease who are undergoing surveillance. So we're shifting gears a little bit. They're gonna undergo both the FACBC or fluciclovine and gallium PSMA um, and, and the same patient and we'll be doing image guided biopsies. Technological developments for the next uh, three years and then we'll be doing a pilot human trial in years four and five. This is an ongoing trial um, that uh, uh, we're doing um, that Ashish Jani and I are um, uh, multiple PIs on. And this is using a fluciclovine PET to help guide radiotherapy. Now we're talking the post-prostatectomy patients. So uh, patients get enrolled, uh, they get randomized either into conventional imaging or um, imaging with fluciclovine plus conventional imaging and there is an intention to treat form. 
uh, then um, the patients get planned based on either the conventional imaging or fluciclidine, depending you know, on what arm they're in. We're going to be looking at PSA-free survival at three years. We're not quite there yet. Um, so far, 136 patients have been accrued out of 162, which is great for an investigator-initiated trial. And uh, the nice thing is that this study design can also be used for other types of imaging. So far, we found a significant change in management, and we have published on this, mostly with radiotherapy field change. Um, and, uh, but in some cases, the radiotherapy has withdrawn as well, such as this patient with unexpected um, retroperitoneal disease, which was not seen on conventional imaging. So we have about a 40% change in management and a higher uh, change in planning volumes uh, as well, and we published on that in the Red Journal. Another study, which is just getting off the ground, and we're doing uh, this with our colleagues in uh, medical oncology, uh, with Asim and, and uh, Omer, is uh, looking at um, to see if fusiclovine can show us changes in um, therapy. So we're taking primary recurrent castration-resistant prostate cancer with skeletal and ornal involvement patients. They're about to commence therapy with docetaxel and prednisone. They'll get a scan at baseline after one cycle and six cycles, and we'll be correlating this with a, a number of uh, markers of outcome. And this is just the first patient that we've done at baseline after one cycle. And we're, again, we're just starting. We need to do many more patients. Another study, which is just getting off the ground, but which is actually um, a recruiting like gangbusters, is um, based on uh, Marty Sanders' U01. Uh, I'm the PI on one of the projects, and with Merdad al Mazofar, uh, one of our urologists and the other urology team, we're looking at high-risk primary prostate cancer um, with presumed localized disease about to undergo uh, surgery and lymph node dissection. So the patients undergo conventional imaging and without definitive uh, systematic metastasis, then they get fusiclovine. For example, this patient here, we see the primary cancer and uh, the nodes, and then uh, they undergo surgery um, after reviewing this with the surgeon, and then the patient gets a superextended lymph node dissection. Our primary aim is to look for distant disease, which would preclude curative surgery, um, but we're also comparing histologic findings to uh, fusiclovine PET. So far, I have been very impressed that even though we're doing these so-called standard template um, extended lymph node dissections, a positive node could be just around the corner, literally right next to the field that they're dissecting. And by reviewing this in advance, you could extend that field a little bit and get that um, node and try to uh, cure the patient. There are some uh, phase three trials which have finished up now, uh, one in the UK and uh, one in the US, and uh, they were closed after successful interim analysis or completed enrollment earlier than anticipated with 100 and 200 patients uh, uh, respectively, and those are going to be analyzed. Those are sponsored by the company, Blue Earth Diagnostics. So this is our FDA-approved indication. Um, it's for recurrent prostate cancer with elevated PSA. This was based on data from over 700 patients imaged in the US, Norway, and Italy. There's an orphan drug status for glioma. We're actually doing some investigation into that too. And there was a Medicare pass-through for reimbursement in January of this year. So it's being reimbursed. As far as at Emory, we're doing these Tuesdays and Thursdays. We don't make, these, make this tracer ourselves on the commercial side. It's made by PetNet, which is actually at Yorkies. And um, we're doing these at uh, EUH and Midtown. We're trying to get St. Joseph's off the ground. Um, and uh, if you need to order these, call Teresa Taylor. Here's the number and then the fax number. Um, and be specific, say this is for recurrent prostate cancer. For some of the private payers, you may have to do a peer-to-peer. -peer. So just like when anything gets new, gets introduced, you, you know, have to kind of break through that barrier. As far as patient preparation, uh, we recommend avoiding exercise one day prior to PET, just so you're familiar with this. We keep the patient's MPO for four hours, um, though there's not a lot of great data to support that, but we think that's the most conservative thing to do. Inject it, and then immediately whole body imaging. One thing you should be aware of, that indolent sclerotic bone lesions may not have uptake. Actually, that's an issue with a lot of radio tracers. So skeletal specific imaging may still be useful. This is a patient with intense uptake in a lytic, non-sclerotic prostate met, kind of moderate uptake with moderate sclerosis, but no uptake with a densely sclerotic lesion. 
So my recommended Im indications are recurrent prostate cancer with rising PSA, of course. It's less sensitive if the PSA is less than 0.5 to 1, but it all depends on PSA kinetics. I would think twice before ordering this with a PSA less than 0.5 with slow kinetics. Okay? Chances are it may not be, it just may not be positive. And um, it's most helpful also with discrepant CT MR bone scan. And of course, you always want to ask yourself before you order an imaging test, how will it impact care? Our kind of general Emory approach, though everyone's a little bit different, um, we still believe a multiparametric multi MR is very, very useful, including anatomy to help plan potential salvage, um, if that's uh, possible, but also to do a fluciclovine PET for full body staging. Again, this is for recurrence. As far as bone scan, I think it's reasonable to get fluciclovine PET CT first. If it's positive in the bone and you biopsy it, then you don't kind of need more. If there are suspicious sclerotic lesions on CT that don't light up and they're densely sclerotic, then I would get a bone scan. But I would specify spec CT or order a sodium fluoride PET. Planar bone scan may just not pick up any of these. It has fairly low diagnostic performance. But it all depends on PSA and clinical presentation. If a patient has a very high PSA level, there's a really high clinical suspicion, CT and bone scan may just give you the answer with less expensively and, and, and simply and serve as a baseline for therapy response. So I don't think the advanced imaging nearly needs to happen all the time. This is a, a couple of our um, adjuvant cases, rising PSA post radical prostatectomy and radiotherapy, triple androgen blockade, had negative FDG PET CT, and we picked up retroperitoneal nodes, sub centimeter, and a, a one centimeter right obturator node. This patient has a PSA of 16.4 post brachy and radiotherapy, multifocal prostate recurrence, and the uh, surgeon and the patient were considering salvage therapy, uh, salvage surgical uh, uh, therapy. And uh, with uh, uh, fluciclovine, we saw uh, uptake in the prostate. We knew there was a recurrence there. There were no pelvic or retroperitoneal nodes, but we picked up right paratracheal and lung nodules, which lit up. Now, these weren't biopsied, so we don't have primary proof, but the patient was placed on ADT, and these melted away. Um, the node and the nodules resolved. Other potential research with amino acid transport tracers um, could include bladder cancer. We're kind of thinking about that. Non-seminomous germ cell tumor, glioma, ovarian recurrence, breast. Just show you a couple of these. Uh, this is from Dr. Mark Goodman's study, which we're um, almost ready to uh, send the paper out. I was able to separate high-grade from low-grade gliomas quite well. And uh, potential investigations could be using this for uh, low-grade glioma and a plastic transformation. Maybe there's an IDH1 relationship that could be explored, maybe added value to MR and directing radiation therapy. And ultimately, the great prize would be progression versus pseudoprogression. That's what everyone is interested in. We also uh, did a small pilot study uh, with breast cancer. We found most utility with lobular cancer, which traditionally with FDG PET, lobular doesn't light up too well. And we could see the same patient had an FDG PET and the fluciclovine PET. This was um, lobular cancer, kind of mild to moderate, but very intense with uh, uh, fluciclovine. Malignant disease had a greater activity than uh, benign lesions. So those are some potential investigations. There may be some uh, maybe some utility for nodal disease as well. And response to therapy might be a good uh, way to investigate this. The cost of adjumin, the commercial dose, we pay to PetNet $38.96, nearly $4,000 for each clinical dose. But if it's going through Medicare, okay, we break even on the radio tracer. Okay? And the cost of PET and Medicare is about $1,400. I'd like to remind everyone, most of that money goes to Emory Healthcare. Okay? Only a small amount goes to our professional fee. And uh, third party, it all depends, okay? It's all over the place, as we know from all the therapies we do. And finally, I'm going to uh, finish up uh, with just some other exciting uh, possibilities. Um, flor fluorine 18 labeled misonidazole, or f -miso, is a radio tracer that's been used for investigating tumor hypoxia. I actually have a, an IND to use this, um, but I was gonna buy it from Cardinal, which is like, three hours away, but they stopped making it. Um, so our own CSI radio pharmacy um, is going to start making it maybe later this year or next year. I have to modify my IND. 
And uh, we have a potential for collaboration in many areas involving tumor hypoxia. There may be also some possibilities of testing some novel hypoxia radio tracers. Other potential oncologic radio tracers, which some we can make here, some we'll have to buy commercially, include fluorothymidine, looking at uh, proliferation, uh, fluorestradiol, DOPA, gallium PSMA. And actually, with our generator, we can make gallium PSMA now, but it's going to come later. Um, and that's, for example, the trial that Bowie and I are going to be doing for primary surveillance, other amino acid transporters, and other radiotherapeutics, such as lutetium or Y90 PSMA at some point, or other types of motifs are possible. So I'd like to thank our entire collaborative team. This is only a partial list, but I can't even fit the names on the, uh, the slide anymore. But everyone, all our colleagues who have all collaborated with us worldwide, because it really uh, takes a team, and that's what team science is all about. Thank you.